um, we are left on our own devices. So the idea was to collect normative data of stable corneas after SMILE with the idea to automatically assess the biomechanical status after laser vision correction. And here are, you see our results of 195, um, 59, no, 95 eyes um, pre-op and three months after SMILE. And you can appreciate a 20% reduction in corneal stiffness, which is about one um, standard deviation. This comes as no surprise, and also that this biomechanical change is correlated to the corneal uh, lenticle thickness that is extracted with SMILE. However, I have to um, plead guilty of not finishing in time all the other analysis that because, as you can see, the correlation is not 100%. It is strongly correlated, but not very strongly. So there must be other factors involved that sh that which we couldn't analyze um, so far. So compared to the literature, there's a very nice study um, um, just published, and their conclusions are in agreement with our conclusions that the biomechanical changes were detectable with the Corvus after flap or cap detection uh, creation, and the um, biomechanical um, softening was about 20%, and LASIK caused more um, weakening in the early period, but not in the late period than the smile cap. So here you can see a visualization of biomechanical changes after SMILE. Um, up above, in blue, the pre-op status before, and in red, after SMILE. You see the indentation is much more pronounced after SMILE than before, and the corneal stiffness change is about um, one diopter softer. Um, however, the corrected IOP is only changed by 0.5 millimeters of mercury. This is another outlook. Um, biomechanical comparison after cross-linking, uh, blue before cross-linking, and stiffer half one month after cross-linking. So there's a big uh, multi-center study ongoing with more than 4,000 eyes. And the idea is to create an index this, that distinguishes stable versus ectectic corneas after laser vision correction. Here you see the analysis post laser vision correction. The first step is to decide, is it an abnormal or a normal uh, behaving um, cornea? And then the second step, is it keratoconus or is it post laser vision correction? If it is post laser vision correction, is it stable or is it ectatic? Here you see the rock analysis. Um, and these are differ the differences between uh, post-laser vision stable and ectatic corneas uh, of single parameters. So in conclusion, uh, the automatic detection of eyes post-laser vision correction and the detection of stable versus unstable corneas after laser vision correction is soon to come on your Corbis device. And the clinical applications include ectasia detection after laser vision correction, and also an, um, help in uh, deciding whether the cornea is stable enough to undergo uh, a retreatment, and it could also be an aid in decision-making for corneal cross-linking after laser vision correction. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now we call upon Dr. Gaurav Lutra. Uh, to talk about when to choose SMILE over LASIK or PRK. Thank you, ma'am, uh, for inviting me to speak on this. And uh, so is there still room for PRK or LASIK after SMILE is uh, how I wanted to word it. 
So I have no financial interests and uh, we all know about uh, how Smile differs from LASIK and PRK essentially. And uh, we also understand that uh, why uh, Smile may be biomechanically superior because you don't have a flap which uh, contributes to the thickness of the cornea. And uh, the previous uh, presentation did uh, speak about the biomechanical strength of uh, post-Smile eyes. So let's look at uh, the armamentarium of refractive surgeries that uh, we have. We still do a lot of PRK. It's good for uh, myopic corrections up to six or seven diopters, which means uh, you cut off at about 100 microns and with small astigmatisms. Smile is obviously possible for corrections uh, up till 12 or 12 diopters of spherical equivalents and astigmatism up to minus five. It's best for myopia between minus one to 10. And uh, hyperopia, pure astigmatism, mixed astigmatism were not available. Recently, we've got access to uh, pure astigmatism as well, and hyperopia is probably going to be available soon. LASIK, of course, has been there for a long time, and I think uh, gives us the most versatility of all the procedures uh, possible for myopia up till minus 11 or 12, if, you'd, if you would choose to do that. Astigmatism, hyperopia as well, and it's one of the procedures which really works well for the refractive results in almost all corrections which are possible with a laser. Uh, if we had to choose uh, corneal thickness uh, for the three procedures, while initially it was thought that smile you could actually you know, compromise on the corneal thickness compared to LASIK, but today all of us understand that the um, cutoff for LASIK and smile probably remains the same as far as your uh, corneal path thickness parameters go and PRK of course, you know, with a normal topography you might be able to go a little uh, lower than that. And uh, leaving behind the residual bed, I would still think today that I would not differentiate between LASIK and SMILE really as far as the residual bed thickness was concerned. And with PRK, of course, we all understand how much it should be. So when we look at PRK, let's look at the pros and cons of PRK. PRK is still quite popular and uh, is one of the procedures which even I like to do quite often. Uh, it has uh, no flap and interface complications, good biomechanics. Uh, it's minimally invasive. And uh, if you look at the problems that we still see with PRK, Patient discomfort remains one, uh, risk of haze, slower visual recovery. If you look at SMILE, the pros, uh, it preserves the Bowman's and anterior stroma, which I think is a great thing. We still don't have studies which can tell us conclusively that that's so much better biomechanically. Uh, no flap complications, lesser dry eye, uh, truer optical zones. So it's a corneal suction, so it's uh, patient can still fixate very well and does fixate straight on the visual axis. And uh, faster rehabilitation, most of our smile patients actually see pretty well starting day one, and uh, they are actually physically so much better than the LASIK and PRK patients, and very minimal precautions following surgery. However, smile comes with it, uh, its bouquet of uh, situations. Enhancements may be more difficult to do with smile. Customized treatments are still not possible. We don't have cyclotorsion control, and uh, range of treatments is less. Uh, uh, also, I would feel that smile in my hands does not work for the really small corrections and I really don't enjoy doing it for the minus ones and 1.5s because you're still removes, removing a lenticule thickness which is significant for no reason and for small correction I still choose other procedures. And yes, it's much more expensive. So when you look at LASIK which has still survived the onslaught of smile, you have the full range of treatments, faster visual rehabilitation than PRK and SMILE. So if patients, some, somebody wants quick visual rehabilitation has to appear for a medical exam, I would still choose LASIK as my procedure of choice. Has an amazing track record for almost 25 years. And yes, all kinds of customizations. We've been doing a lot of topo guided treatments and contura treatments uh, in the last couple of years. Enhancements are so much easier to perform and easy access to surgeons. There's a machine almost around the corner anywhere you go. And it's obviously much cheaper. Uh, now, these are the things, and we've been seeing through the day today about LASIK flap complications in the previous sessions, so saw a few of these. These are really a nightmare for refractive surgeons. They don't happen often, but when they do happen, they can really compromise the quality of vision. So uh, I think uh, higher risk of ectasia seen with LASIK as compared to PRK and SMILE as well is something which we should be looking at. Now, in our practice, we did started SMILE just about two and a half years back, and uh, in the first year of 2017, uh, since we were very excited about SMILE, our practice was about 60% SMILE, 30% LASIK, and 10% surface. The year 2018, and probably the same thing continues this year, uh, we've increased our PRK numbers, and I'll tell you why. Our SMILE numbers went down by about 10%, and LASIK stays about the same. Now, why this happened was that 
we got better understanding of the smile results and limitations and case selections were much better. Plus we started using more newer techniques for PRK with better pain control and uh, Streamlight uh, Trans PRK was, uh, be became available to us. We started doing that. We've been using AccuWell Soak BCL for pain control and it has been remarkable for our PRK patients. And uh, we soaked the BCL uh, before uh, inserting it for about five minutes um, in AccuWell. The pain scores have gone away completely. These patients are so much happier. Here. You can uh, usually uh, put in the procedure. There's no point showing you the procedure. It's about the same as any PRK. And uh, post-op patients can be extremely comfortable. So today, we prefer PRK for small corrections, thinner and suspect corneas, uh, when combining it with a cross-linking procedure, enhancements after LASIK and smile, and professor, with their professions which require no corneal marks. Uh, we still prefer smile for myopes uh, from minus 2 to minus 9. Uh, with astigmatism up to about three diopters. Yes, for sports persons, professions with higher risk of trauma, I would definitely choose smile, especially with the high corrections, uh, borderline dry eye situations, and those seeking faster rehabilitation physically and lesser precautions uh, want to get back to work as soon as possible. I still do uh, LASIK, uh, femtolasic mostly. Hyperopes is a significant group for us, and we treat a lot of hyperopes and uh, also mixed astigmatism. Uh, with high astigmatism, I would choose a contour treatment over smile. And those seeking faster visual recovery, I would definitely choose LASIK. Uh, we do customizations with uh, topoguided treatments and wavefront, and those are possible only with LASIK. And also, of course, there are patients who cannot afford smile. So I think uh, when we talk about all the procedures, I think there is no one modality which is perfect for every situation. And uh, I think all modalities have a place in the refractive surgeon, Zama Mentarium, fake lenses as well. We didn't speak about those, but they are beginning to occupy a big uh, space in our surgical Zama Mentarium as well. Uh, smile is emerging as a preferred option for a good chunk of our cases because of the inherent advantage of being flap-free. And PRK and LASIK, I think, still have a big role in most many, many situations, and they just cannot be abandoned. And uh, once I think hyperopic smile becomes available, their indications for LASIK may go down uh, as well. But we definitely need uh, longer bio bio biomechanical data on SMILE to be absolutely sure of that. So with that, uh, I would like to close. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was very clear. Even a non-refractive person can understand what case to choose. That, that's what it was meant for, actually. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thanks. I'd like to call upon the next speaker, Dr. Brandon from USA, to talk about suture rivals. Hey, thanks guys. Thanks IT guys too for this whole meeting. My name is Brandon. Uh, Brandon Ayers from Philadelphia. My charge is suture fixated IOLs. wells. We're going to focus on the foldable suture fixated IOLs. wells. These are my financial disclosures. So it won't impact us for this talk. Video-based course, we're going to talk about some of the techniques used for suture fixation and some of the different IOLs and some of the advantages and disadvantages of those IOLs. And the rage recently has been suturing foldable IOLs. Whenever you're talking about this kind of technique, you want to make sure you're prepared. You want to know where the lens is, if they're doing an exchange, is the patient phacic, aphacic, or pseudophacic, and where is that implant? You'll need some extra instruments as well. And the key to these procedures is centration and measurements. You want to make sure you're measuring straight across the visual axis. We are now going three millimeters posterior to limbus and about four millimeters apart, some people wider. Now the reason for that is the, one of the more common implants is the hydrophobic, or sorry, hydrophilic acrylic AO60. And the haptics on that AO60 are about four millimeters apart. Now the trick with this is that the implant does not fit sulcus to sulcus, so balancing your suture tension is critical for proper IOL position and centration. So this is a case of a dislocated IOL, and you see we're making our marks on the limbus for centration, simply using the trocar to measure three millimeters back and four millimeters apart. When I'm putting in trocars, uh, there's no incision yet that's gone into the eye. So the eye is fully pressurized and these are going in. Um, I would suggest 
putting trocars or making your scleral incisions in the eye when the eye is still formed or when there's an infusion cannula in place. Vitrectomy is always important, uh, again, focusing on keeping the eye pressurized. Eyes do not like hypotony. Um, I don't know what kind of implant this is, but I found out that it's a PMMA lens during the surgery and removed it, having to make a slightly larger wound than I had planned. This is the Gore-Tex CV-8 suture. It is not approved for this technique, and neither is the IOL. The way we're lacing the implant, it's down through one haptic, over, and then up through the other. What that does is that pushes the implant a little bit further down in the eye, keeping it away from the iris and ciliary body. I like to pre-lace this particular implant so all the sutures are already externalized before I put the implant in. There are other techniques. Fold the implant, put it in place, and now we will work on balancing our suture tension. This is where it's critical to have the anterior chamber maintainer on. You want the eye pressurized while you're balancing suture tension. It's not too tight, not too loose, and make sure it's centered. Bury the Gore-Tex knot carefully into the sclerotomy. I use the sclerotomy where the trocar was, and what I think is critical is closing that sclerotomy. Most of the complications that we have seen from suture fixated IOLs are due to suture erosion and knot exposure. So I suture that sclerotomy, close up the conch, and there the case is done. So these, this works very well for suture fixation. We've got excellent results, but hydrophilic acrylic material has this problem, which we've discussed earlier today, and that's calcification. These are photos provided by Liliana Werner out in Utah for me. Now, we're going to take a quick break. We often show these surgeries and we sort of skip the subtle stuff. So I want to show you a very helpful, tint, uh, helpful hint. Whenever we're passing suture through these uh, incisions in the sclerotomies, I think it's helpful to pass the suture through the more proximal or proximal to the surgeon's sclerotomy first. If you pass the distal suture first, you have a very small area to pass the second suture without causing a twist, which will then, which will then mess up your sutured IOL. If you pass the proximal suture first, you have almost the entire pupillary space to hit the mark, if you will, with your second suture, it makes it much easier. So in most of these situations, you're gonna see us passing or me passing the proximal suture first. Now this problem, getting back to my previous topic, the problem with the hydrophilic acrylic material has led us to look for other implants that we can suture using a similar technique. So here's a dislocated IOL. The, the incision architecture and what we're doing is exactly the same. We're measuring 180 degrees across at the limbus. We're going three millimeters back and four millimeters apart. Doing an anterior vitrectomy, exchanging a lens if there's a lens to be exchanged. The trocar goes proximal. That is only out of convention for me. Many surgeons don't even use trocars. They just make a sclerotomy with whatever, whatever instrument you like. Now, in this case, we're going to be suturing a hydrophobic acrylic IOL. This is the Bausch & Lomb MX60. Again, everything you're seeing here is off-label. And the suture pattern I'm using, that Gore-Tex suture comes over top of the haptic through that, that internal pillar and then out over the haptic again so there's no torque induced by this IOL. But for this to work and look good afterwards, that, that suture pattern has to stay that way inside the eye. And with an open loop haptic like this, that can be challenging. So a difference from suturing the, the four point fixation like you get with the AO60, here I'm gonna lace the leading haptic, leave the trailing haptic laced but not pulled out through the sclera. What that lets us do is push the IOL back down in the posterior segment, leaving those trailing sutures hanging down, and then I'll grab them secondarily like you see here. Now the implant looks a little wonky right now, but just give it a few minutes, uh, and you'll see as I pull this suture, suddenly the implant will right itself. By, by lacing and pulling the sutures through a little bit differently, like I've shown in this video, it just helps ensure that your suture pattern is correct and you're not gonna induce any tilt on that implant. Burying the suture, closing the sclerotomy and the conjunctiva is otherwise exactly the same. So now we're able to do a small foldable implant with a hydrophobic material, which is safer if the patient should ever need air, gas, or oil. Now, it's not just for small foldable IOLs. We can apply the same technique to larger implants. The only difference is you have to make a larger incision. So here's a place, a patient who had a proline sutured IOL. One of the prolines has released, and the implant was mispowered for this patient. So instead of refixating the existing implant, we opted to change it to get a better refractive result. The measurements, the instrumentation is all identical, but there are multiple ways described to 
to fashion the suture to the implant. I use a torque, anti-torque, but there are multiple patterns. And I will tell you right away that this video is already on YouTube, so if you don't catch some of this, you can go on YouTube and see it again. Now, one of the major advantages of a larger implant like this, this is the CZ70BD, um, is that once the implant goes in, there's no need to balance suture tension. This implant will fit sulcus to sulcus, so you can basically just stretch the, the haptics out till it reaches the sclera, tie your knots, and bury it. I still close the same way I would in the other cases, though. So multiple techniques have been described for fixation of an IO welt in the absence of capsular support. You do need some additional instrumentation, and you really need to make sure you know the other pathologies in that patient to do a good job at selecting the implant to be placed. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. We call upon the next speaker, Dr. Brian from USA, to talk about capsular phonics hydrodissection, why you should adopt this hydrodissection technique. Can I just do it from there? Can I just do it from here? Well, thank you for having me. All right. We got the marathon runners as long survivors. Give yourselves a hand. <laughs> All right. Okay, here we go. Um, so my name is Brian Kim. Thank you again for having me. I'm really enjoying your country and uh, enjoying this meeting. All right. So. What happened? So, so tell me, uh, most people don't, we had a lot of talks about advanced techniques, but I'm going to go right back to the basics. And hydrodissection is something we all have to do with cataract surgery, and I think most of us don't have problems with hydrodissection, but sometimes we do. And this is a talk about how we can narrow that down or eliminate that problem. Okay, so hydrodissection is to create a fluid dissection wave, but using balanced salt solution to separate the lens from the bag. And you want to mobilize and be able to spin the lens freely within the bag in order to do your cataract surgery. And so there's two basic cannulas and techniques. You have an obtuse angled cannula and a right angle cannula. The obtuse angled cannula usually is placed contraincisionally or, you know, off to the side and you can create the hydrodissection wave. And then the right angle, most people do it subincisionally, but the te technique is basically the same. You're placing the opening of the cannula fairly close to the capsular rexus edge. And so because of that flaw in the technique, sometimes the fluid comes anteriorly instead of going posteriorly, and hydrodissection doesn't work. And so if I'm the only one in this room that has that problem, then I'll just walk off stage. But I know that this is not just my problem. And if it's not, then hopefully this will be helpful to you. So um, it's exactly what I just said. So the hydrodissection wave doesn't occur successfully, and you have to try different places. And then more cortex and epinucleus is coming out and obscuring your view. And you're like, oh, did I get the hydrodissection wave or not? Oh, uh, let, let's just move on. And then, you know, by the time you're getting started, you know, the lens doesn't move. So, so we all understand this principle. The, the fluid will always follow the path of least resistance. And so the key is to make the path of least resistance posterior instead of anterior. How do we do that? So first, the, the ideal technique. What's the ideal technique? One, it's easy to learn. It's simple to perform. It's safe, highly reproducible. And uh, of course, you know, it doesn't add additional cost, right? And so this is a technique. I have a 1.4 millimeter long blunt tipped right angle cannula. It's a longer than a typical cannula. You place it through the main incision, slide it under the capsular rexus edge contraincisionally, and the cannula is placed uh, peripherally into the capsular fornix. You, you, you go out f far enough to, to hit the fornix, and then it's just like with horizontal chop, and then you rotate the cannula 90 degrees pointing down. And this is the key. If you keep pushing peripherally, you'll hit the capsular bag, and you can't do that. And uh, if you do that, then it's going to be stuck. The cannula will not express the fluid. But then if you go too proximally, you'll actually cause hydrodelineation into the lens material. So you have to kind of find that potential space in between when you place that cannula out to the uh, fornix. So then you push BSS, you can see the orientation of the cannula out. 
And uh, when you do it correctly, the hydrodynamic wave just kind of flows very freely. And again, like I said, it's not that hard to do. Once you complete the hydrodissection wave, you want to make sure that the fluid does build up in the, in the space between the bag and the, and the lens. And then you want to decompress the bag. I like to decompress uh, on one pole. Uh, and don't push too, too much, because then you can uh, potentially blow out the posture capsule. And if you do too much, it, it kind of restricts your ability to rotate the lens. So you do have to decompress it. And that, also, that maneuver also helps free anterior capsular adhesions. So again, like I said here, I like to decompress one pole, and then I like to sweep the cannula up and down to free the anterior capsular edge, and I do the same thing on the other side, and lo and behold, the lens will just begin to spin. So if you could help me um, play the videos now. Oh, should I do it here? Okay, let's see. All right, so here, here is it. So you get cannulas out to the equator. You saw the hydrodissection wave decompress. Uh, sweep to the left and then to the right, and then you can see the, the lens just spins nicely. So same thing, you go underneath the capsular axis edge, go to the capsular fornix, rotate down, you saw the wave occur, decompress, sweep to the left, sweep to the right, and uh, it just, just very, very smooth. So these are all different cases. I know it looks like the same case, but it's not, and it's, it's this consistent. Every time you do it, this is what I get, every single case. So smaller pupils, it's the same maneuver, even though you don't see as well to the capsular rexus. You still slide it out, rotate the tip down, get the hydrodissection wave, decompress, sweep to the left, sweep to the right, and the, the lens is, is mobile. So this is uh, even smaller pupil, it's the same, same maneuver again. Place it out to the fornix, rotate it 90 degrees down, decompress the bag, sweep to the left, sweep to the right, and the lens will begin to move. Okay. So again, the ideal technique, it's easy to learn, simple to perform, safe, highly pr reproducible, and it doesn't add additional cost. Don't do it the old way, the way we all learn how to do hydrodissection. If you want to do a better technique, more consistent, not have any trouble with hydrodissection, I do suggest for you to give this a try, and I think you won't regret it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. I would like to call upon the next speaker, Dr. James, from USA, to talk about digital visualization, guidance, and robotics for ocular surgery. Thank you so much. I've thoroughly enjoyed my time here, and we'll give my last discussion, and I'm going to talk about 3D digital visualization for cataract surgery. Advance. So a few different systems that are out there include the Alcon Ingenuity system, the Sony system, as well as a new Zeiss system. These are all 3D heads-up systems that have a camera and a, a monitor. Um, as an example, for the Alcon Ingenuity system, there's the uh, HDR camera, which is a high dynamic range camera that takes uh, multiple images in rapid succession and processes them with image processing and then displays the results on an ultra high def uh, monitor, 4K monitor. There are key benefits, in my opinion, to using these systems. First of all, it's amazing 3D resolution. The quality of vision on these monitors are outstanding, and there's a few reasons why. You feel immersed when you're doing the surgery, that you're within the eye when you do the surgery. First, there's digital uh, image optimization, and none of these take place in a traditional analog type microscope. Also, the surgical ergonomics are better, and uh, there's collaborable, collaborative ep efforts that can be done using these systems. The high magnification performance, so as you increase the magnification in these units, you get better depth resolution. In other words, you get improvements in how the, uh, the quality of the image is. You're able to resolve images at depth, so multiple focus ranges. What you do is you zoom in, you magnify to produce this immersive view with increased depth and resolution as well as contrast. You want to keep the image large on the monitor, like on the left, not on the right. 
On the right is typical how we use through oculars. We have no motion to move around. Whereas on the monitor, we have much greater room. There's also extended depth of field and depth resolution. And what's interesting about the increased depth of field is the amount of difference is positively correlated with the amount of accommodative loss in the surgeon's view. So any operator will gain depth of field by using these units, but surgeons with presbyopia will appreciate a greater difference. What again you do is to maximize the zoom to improve that depth resolution. Also these are designed to use lower light illumination. So this will reduce any phototoxicity for our patients, and some of our cases are quite quick with cataracts, but other ocular surgeries, not so much. I use these units on all of my cases. The cameras are actually developed to amplify the image so we can use lower light levels. There's also digital filters so we can change coloration. We can see structures better in the eye. So the ergonomic benefits, why would we use heads-up display? when we're operating. Well, you can comfortably position yourself. You're not locked in to keeping your head in front of the oculars. It avoids hyperextending the neck and causing these chronic kind of work-related, repetitive work injuries. There's less cervical, shoulder, and lumbar stress. You can feel it when you operate on a regular scope and you go back to this. And as I mentioned, you don't have to accommodate. There's no accommodation. You have freedom to move when you're in the operating room. You're not locked to one position, and you have full peripheral view of the operating room. You can see everything going on. So you're not limited to that position of, of looking through the scope anymore. The time spent at traditional or more um, analog type microscopes lead to poor neck and back posture and leads to fatigue and injuries. 62% of patients in one study, sorry, 62% of surgeons, ophthalmologic surgeons, had back or neck problems. So this affects us and really could extend our careers by using systems like this, extend our longevity of doing surgery. There's actually an American Academy of Ophthalmology ergonomic task force that has been developed for these reasons alone. I also like this portion that I call shared visualization. Everyone else sees exactly what I see when I operate, live as well as recorded. No better, no worse. And I think surgeon as well as the staff are more engaged for this reason. They partake in surgery. They know what instrument to hand. Much more so aware of the surroundings. And when vendors visit, when industry visits, they see this view in 3D that they've never seen before. It makes us think in different ways, especially with our industry uh, colleagues. Teaching residents, other doctors that visit, both nationally and internationally, uh, they can understand better what's going on in three dimensions rather than two and gives real-time feedback. What about problems, latency? In current formats of the 3D visualization, any lag which occurs inside the eye is negligible. It's actually imperceptible right now. The, the lag time is so low. So you don't notice any movement differences. The total what's called perceptual latency is, is within that norm. So it doesn't exist, that latency issue or problem. And studies have been done to show some of these things in comparison. And uh, Dr. Weinstock has a publication in press that he showed uh, similar times, slightly quicker surgical times and, and lower complication rate using 3D, but really no statistically significant difference between that and uh, the traditional microscope. I also like presenting at meetings such as this when I can present in 3D. Now the system to present in 3D has to be set up that way at, at, uh, at conventions it is not here. But you could show the use of new instruments and tools, things like that, at small or large uh, meetings. And finally, I'm excited about potential future applications. And these are all in development right now, and they include uh, surgical cockpit, improved cataract workflow, as well as digital tracking of uh, eye movements in all axes using waypoints, almost like GPS, type points and uh, robotics. And the surgical cockpit basically enables information and surgical efficiency right on the screen. That whole side of the screen can give uh, diagnostic technology, overlays like topography, 
um, OCT. And you notice, you know, we're operating on a round eye, and we're using, in this case, a, a rectangular screen. So the whole third of the screen I can use for patient data, demographics, how dense a lens is, if there's loose zonules, things like that, as well as I can show uh, OCT. And finally, improved cataract workflow. There's cloud-based software which will connect multiple diagnostic devices and surgical devices together. Seamless integration of diagnostics and pull this data of demographics right off electronic medical records, as well as the diagnostics and data management to give us surgical planning, interoperative guidance, as well as feedback for postoperative outcomes optimization. So overall, this provides a, a real clinical process and consistency and much greater efficiency. Thank you. Thank you. We call upon the next speaker, Dr. Marjan from USA to talk about cataract surgery in post keratoplasty eyes. Had a wonderful time and I've been honored to be here and this is our last talk. So um, we're gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about cataract surgery and some pearls in doing cataract surgery after corneal transplantation. So one of the prime considerations or one of the first considerations I see in a patient who's had a corneal transplant and now has a cataract is how is the health of my graft? Is, can I just go ahead and do cataract surgery or do I, is the cornea already uh, borderline unstable and decompensating? So how do I make this decision? Well, I look at some objective measurements. I look at our specular microscopy. I want to evaluate the endothelial health. So I want to look at the endothelial cells. The number is interesting, but it doesn't tell me much about how the function of the cells is. I look at the slit lamp. Is there visually significant haze or thickening? Is there gouttae? And then finally, probably the most useful objective measurement is the pachymetry. And that tells me how the endothelial cells are actually functioning. So if my corneal thickness is uh, 650 certainly and, and higher, I'm looking at regrafting them either at the same time as cataract surgery or regrafting them first and then doing cataract surgery. If the corneal thickness is below 600, I'm feeling pretty good and the corneal clarity is okay, then I can go ahead and do cataract surgery alone. So there are several sources of uh, trauma to the corneal graft during cataract surgery, um, and they're not all phaco energy. The first one we always think of is, okay, yes, phaco energy, especially in dense cataract, certainly can lead to endothelial trauma, but there's other things. There's chatter, there's flying nuclear fragments, which can have mechanical trauma to the endothelium. There's the irrigation or the water pressure against the cornea, that is another source of trauma. And then there's stromal edema from the wound closure that can um, cause excess strain on the endothelial cells. So what are some things we can do to sort of protect against these traumas? Generous use of dispersive viscoelastics in patients who've had corneal transplants. Now we're going in and doing phaco. It may require stopping multiple times during the phaco emulsification to reapply that dispersive viscoelastic and really uh, uh, put in a protective barrier or shield between the endothelium and, and the sources of trauma during the surgery. I like to use quick chop techniques in, uh, for nuclear disassembly, again, to minimize my phaco energy and time and my manipulation. And then keeping the phaco tip at the center of the eye is the furthest place from the cornea. So doing a chop technique allows the phaco tip also to stay in the center of the eye. And then I like to use sort of a faster, like a Venturi pump to improve followability so I don't have chatter and flying uh, nuclear segments um, in the anterior chamber. I always pay attention that my irrigation ports are away from direct trauma into the cornea and I, lo I lower the bottle height, again, to minimize that water pressure on the endothelium. In terms of wound considerations, I always use a suture to close my wounds if a patient has had a corneal transplant. I don't want to do stromal hydration and add excess strain on the endothelial cells. Sometimes I'll even move back and do a scleral tunnel, again, to minimize my trauma into the corneal graft. If there's corneal previous 
uh, wound gaping issues, more sutures may be needed to reappose those graft edges. This is, uh, again, an eye that's had uh, corneal transplantation. The graft is still pretty clear, but patient has a significantly dense cataract. Um, these patients can sometimes have posterior synechiae and anterior synechiae. So sometimes we spend a little bit of extra time releasing those synechiae from the uh, junction. The graft host junction is often where these synechiae form. So removing those, if there's uh, membranes that have formed, removing those carefully to really clear up and, and free up that iris. So in this case, we're putting in a uh, Malugan ring uh, to help us with visualization. Our capsulorexis is then done. If the cataract is dense, sometimes we'll use tripan blue in these cases to help with visualization. Good hydrodissection, I always uh, tell my residents, don't underestimate the power of a good hydrodissection to really keep that lens mobile. And then using phaco chop technique, trying to stay in the center of the eye and furthest away from the cornea here. Uh, I like to use, in some of these cases, a vertical chop technique that allows me to really stay centered. And once we start freeing up some of the pieces, uh, then we're sort of home free on, uh, from that perspective. So here we're seeing a phaco chop here, centrally uh, trying to, again, minimize uh, chatter, minimizing uh, trauma. Uh, again, keeping my irrigation ports away from the cornea. I'll just jump ahead a little bit here. This is pretty standard at this point. Again, stopping multiple times to reapply dispersive viscoelastic. I'm using a three-piece lens here because it does give me a little bit of a uh, uh, versatility in case we ever need to go back in and either remove or replace the cornea and do any kind of lens manipulation. And finally, I always use one or two sutures to close the wound uh, to minimize any further trauma to the endothelial cells. What about power calculation for the lens? This can sometimes be a challenge. I use multiple techniques, topography as well as IOL master to obtain good K measurements. I do have intraoperative aberrometry as well to help me with determining. If it's a post DSEC or DMEC, we may shift the IOL power for DSEC. Uh, we um, aim a little bit more myopic for the IOL choice because of the hyperopic shift from the cornea. So somewhere between a minus 0.75 to minus 0.125 for DSEC. And for DMEC, about a quarter to a half. Uh, because it's a physiologic change in decimase, you don't have to make as much of an IOL power shift. What about in a previous PK or DALC? Well, in these cases, I'm looking for uh, the regularity of the astigmatism and the symmetry of the corneal astigmatism to help me determine whether or not I will put a toric lens. The thing that helps me the most is looking at the spectacle-corrected visual acuity or a manifest refraction. If the patient uh, manifests well with a cylinder in the spectacle plane, that tells me that they're tolerable of the lower order aberrations and they don't have significant higher order aberrations or asymmetry in their graft. Those patients often do well with a toric lens. I always tell patients you'll need full suture removal before we can do the cataract surgery and oftentimes it's a two-stage rehabilitation where we'll do the keratoplasty first and then the lens. So this is one patient, I'll end with this, patient post uh, femtosecond laser keratoplasty. We had full su suture removal at a year. Patient had six and a quarter uh, diopters of astigmatism uh, on topography. We were not able to manifest uh, because of the dense cataract, but when we looked at the topography, it was very, very um, symmetrical. And in this case, we went ahead and put in a toric lens and were able to lower that astigmatism to a tolerable range to put into spectacles. So toric lenses, I'm just gonna skip to my last um, slide, are really a great uh, choice for uh, post keratoplasty where the graft is symmetrical um, and uh, we want to minimize endothelial trauma and make appropriate IOL shifts in cases of EK. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Now we call upon Dr. Michael from Switzerland to talk about tissue addition technology for corneal and refractive surgery. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to thank again the organizers to have the opportunity to be here in Jenai. It's really a wonderful experience. Thank you. I'm going to share with you a little bit of uh, technology I'm involved in over the last uh, couple of years where we're going to use human donor tissue for refractive procedures. And we call it tissue addition technology 
because instead of doing an exomalase ablation where we remove tissue, we're actually trying and, and adding tissue. Where do we see the applications? If you look at the broad range of refractive corrections for younger patients, mainly myops, I think LASIK is doing a fantastic job, smile uh, for, for the myopic part. However, if you look at hyperopic treatments, there's still a challenge if you do LASIK procedures, and especially for presbyopia, doing a, a compromise treatment for early presbyopes, um, starting age of 40, maybe to, to 55, uh, uh, tissue addition technology can be a nice compromise. Um, we act and uh, implant them like a corneal inlay, and corneal inlays are, are not new. They have been developed as uh, uh, plastic materials or synthetics over the last uh, almost 30 years. However, every time we put in a, a piece of plastic into the cornea, the cornea starts to react. You notice from, from multiple applications. And if you look at the physiology involved, uh, if you implant a uh, synthetic material, what you're going to do is you're actually changing the metabolism uh, within the cornea by allowing the glucose or oxygen diffusion. And the second thing what happens is you're actually adding a sandwich material. So you have two materials with two different mechanical properties. And if you have permanent motion in the cornea due to eyelid or intraocular pressure fluctuations, you have a permanent inflammatory reaction due to the implant. And this has led to uh, quite severe complications using uh, synthetic inlays. So using tissue uh, as a refractive procedure is not new. Epicardophagy have been out there since the, the 50s from Barakur, but there were limitations. They were not really predictable. The optical quality was not good. They had to be sutured, and uh, usually were very thick lenticles. And, um, using available donor tissue, it was actually not commercial viable. More recent work has been done, uh, especially also here in, in India, from, from Jews and Jacob and uh, from, from, from Ganesh. They used smile lenticles for hyperopic corrections, uh, recovered from, from other patients and implanted and transferred. Um, they showed pretty good refractive results. However, if you want to give and provide uh, tissue on a larger extent, there are some limitations to smile lenticles. First of all, um, it requires quite con a strong disease control, especially in Europe and in the US. Uh, it's the, the costly part, uh, part of recovering tissue is actually the disease control. Um, femtosecond laser have a limitation in accuracy, especially if you go to presbyopia corrections, you cannot achieve those positions. Fresh tissue is very difficult to ship and to transport. And uh, that gives you a time limitation between transplantation and uh, donation. And it's uh, uh, no ability at the moment to do a customized treatment. So what did we develop? So there's pretty much three technology changes that happened over the last years. First of all, tissue processing. Today we can recover tissue, we can sterilize tissue, and we can uh, store tissue at room temperature for two years. So that was a, a big development uh, with our partner at Lion Vision Gift in the United States. The second thing, there's a complete change in how we can do optical measurements and optical metrology. You know OCT systems from the clinic. OCT systems used in industry are much more precise and much more reliable. So you can use those systems to measure these lenticles. And the third thing that happens, we have a much better understanding of treatment planning. We can incorporate in, uh, biomechanics, we can incorporate epithelium modeling in doing those uh, by, um, planning of the procedures. So if we combine those three things together with x laser technology to shape the lenticles. So we're recovering tissue from my banks. These corneas are not suitable for a fresh tissue transplant. They usually have a lack of endothelium cells. So we can use the stroma we can slice those tissue, uh, the corneas, into, uh, we call them blanks. For presbyopia, we're getting about 100 blanks out of one cornea. So it gets commercial viable. And the second thing is we're using an in-house exime laser. That's not a clinical exime laser. It's actually an exime laser used, used for microchip production to shape those lenticles. They're processed, they're packaged, and shipped to the clinic in a pre-packaged fashion. So this is an example how you can, you know, how the tissue uh, comes in a double pouch and then a special package. This is in the OR. And uh, in the second step, then the clinician can uh, pretty much take the lenticle. We develop two special instruments, and uh, the instrument which we call the loop actually contains a little water drop 
that water drop has a surface tension, and because the tissue is so thin, a presbyopial lenticle only has 20 microns, you actually can use that tissue without any mechanical force. And I'm showing this example here, how you can manipulate actually the tissue in the loop uh, without any mechanical stress. In surgery, the way it is, this is a presbyopia lenticle. You take the loop in the water bubble, you place it over the pupil, you can center it through the water to the loop, to the microscope is nice, and then you break the surface tension of the water bubble, and then the tissue just folds nicely over the cornea without any stress. Initially, we were thinking we go for a pocket solution, but we learned if you do a pocket solution, especially for presbyopia, those lenticles are so thin, they're very hard to manipulate, and we decided as a first step to go uh, through a, a, a lazy flap procedure. Well, the other benefit is uh, we're currently starting a study together with Professor Kilic in Turkey. We're actually starting combining mono myopic uh, LASIK with a presbyopia implant. So what can we observe clinically in presbyopia? Uh, what we're doing is kind of a hyperprolate cornea. So we're inducing fourth and sixth order spheric collaboration to increase depth of focus. Patients experience a slight myopic shift of about a half a diopter. And in addition, they're getting an extended depth of focus. In this study, we currently treated uh, 45 eyes. All patients had an uncorrected, uh, neo vision uncorrected of 24 or worse before surgery. They owed significantly gain in uh, neo vision abilities by about four to five lines in neo vision. And slit lamp, uh, especially if you look at the slit lamp after three months or six months, it's almost impossible to see the lenticles. It's very hard to see the margins, and so far we haven't really observed any, any uh, reactions on the cornea um, um, at the follow-up periods, what we know from synthetic materials. Also kind of a, a thing, we initially we think we can use OCT to measure the thickness of the lenticles, but we realized that the resolution of the clinical systems is not suitable, so because of the low boundaries we're getting, it's almost impossible to see them in OCT. Thank you very much for your interest. Thank you. We call upon the last speaker of this session, Dr. Naveen Rao from USA, to talk about DMEC preloaded. So thanks everyone for staying. We've had such a wonderful time at your meeting and it was really an enjoyable meeting. Uh, not only an educational meeting, but, but really fun. So uh, thanks for having us and I hope we get a chance to join you again uh, in the future, either at this meeting or at future meetings. Let me see, can we play this? Yeah, okay. So uh, this is first uh, a video of, of several cases. What I want to talk about is preloaded DMEC surgery. Um, which uh, was uh, uh, pioneered by Lions Vision Gift Eye Bank. I'm the medical director, one of the medical directors for Lions Vision Gift in uh, Boston. Um, is it playing? Uh, I'll control it from here then. Okay. So I want to show first what we used to do. This is the old way of uh, preparing a DMEC tissue. First we stain the periphery with tripan, punch it to the size we want, in this case 7.5 millimeters, and then we remove this donut-shaped ring of decimase that's on the periphery of the graft that we want. After that donut is removed, we can pick up the graft with a tying forceps, and then we dunk that into its own tripan bath, leaving it in this bath for four minutes. And for four minutes, it stains. After that time, we use wax cell sponges to remove the, decima the, the tripen. And then we fill that bowl up with more BSS and remove uh, the graft using a Jones tube that's connected to a, uh, uh, a uh, uh, connector tubing, silicone French catheter tubing. And then 
insert that uh, into the eye. Of course, you're familiar with these tapping maneuvers, but if you're a PDEC surgeon, the same techniques uh, essentially can apply. Uh, I believe uh, the uh, Lions um, Eye Bank in Tampa is preparing the um, prepared uh, preloaded pre PDEC tissue for, uh, for the United States market. So this is how it's shipped. It's shipped in a Jones tube, which uh, is uh, placed in a Kroll viewing chamber. And this Optisol is not the original Optisol that the graft was, uh, that the eye was uh, recovered in, but rather fresh Optisol that was placed at the eye bank. And this is what we receive. It has a blue silicone cap at one end because in shipping tests when we originally started this, we realized in some cases that it was jostled, being jostled during shipping and the graft was coming out of the tube in floating around in the viewing chamber. So after that, we started placing the silicone blue cap on the end and uh, that prevents the graft from get, being expelled during transit. Sometimes you get these air bubbles and they have to be filled up so that that air bubble doesn't end up going into the eye when you inject the graft. But here I'm connecting this piece of 14 French silicone catheter tubing that uh, now is being shipped uh, or can be shipped if needed with the graft, but you can also get it from the uh, uh, sterile supply room in your hospital. If there are air bubbles like this, one of the things that we need to do is either fill up with some BSS or push some uh, saline through the syringe that this tubing is connected to to eliminate those air bubbles so they don't end up in the eye when you need to unfold the graft. But you have to be careful when expelling these, uh, these air bubbles and moving the graft toward the edge of the Jones tube because this can happen. Oh, what happened there? The graph shot out, and I made a mistake. This was my first case where I made the mistake of not really not moving the graph toward the edge over a basin of BSS. So don't do what I did here, but I luckily had this puddle of BSS that was still supporting the graft, and it was still fortunately uh, very uh, very useful. So here, of course, uh, the tapping maneuvers once again. These grafts have been stained in TriPan 24 hours previously, at least for us, because that's when the eye bank prepared it and shipped it, uh, so it the surgery is 24 hours later, but uh, this can be shipped internationally and one of my former fellows in Jordan has been using like this and has been able to uh, have nicely darkly stained uh, uh, grafts even despite the longer shipping of course. So here again is how the, uh, uh, the uh, graft is, is shipped. I usually will rinse the tube, uh, the Jones tube in some BSS because the Optisol is a little bit slippery and if you're trying to connect the Jones tube to this connector tubing with a slippery Optisol on the outside of the tube, it can sometimes uh, roll right out of your hand. So you have to be a little bit careful always doing this over a Petri dish full of BSS or some kind of basin full of BSS so that the graft doesn't end up on the table. Now. The neat, the neat thing about this blue cap is that it acts as a little regulator, so you can slowly allow the BSS to come through, and it doesn't. The graft doesn't shoot out of the uh, uh, of the uh, uh, Jones tube too quickly because that regulates the flow, the speed at which the BSS is exiting the Jones tube. So once that's prepared. I usually take off that blue cap just at the moment when I'm about to inject it uh, into the eye. And, uh, and so here is just another example where I left that cap on. Sometimes, though, you push it a little bit too far and then it gets too close to the edge of the tube so you can still pull it back before it slips out all the way. So this is how we've evolved in DMEC tissue prep. We used to have the whole cornea, then we moved on to pre-strip tissue, then pre-marked tissue. We used to use an S stamp, now we use an F stamp because it has a smaller area and that means less endothelial loss. Then we move to pre-punched tissue and finally pre-loaded tissue. Now does this cause endothelial cell loss? In, in short, yes. Pre-loading the tissue does cause increased endothelial cell loss, but it's not a whole lot more than just the pre-stripping the tissue alone. And the nice thing about this endothelial cell loss is when you're given this tissue from the eye bank, you'll know exactly what the endothelial cell count is in the pre-loaded tissue because we can do specular in the Jones tube. When you're doing this in the operating room, uh, when you're preparing this tissue for your own cases, you will have no idea what that uh, endothelial cell loss is because typically you're not doing a specular on the pre, um, uh, on, the, on the stripped and, and uh, prepared tissue that you've done yourself. So the pre-stripping alone will cause about 9.3 percent endothelial cell loss. Preloading and shipping it uh, in shipping tests across the country from the west coast and to the east coast and to the south, it resulted in endothelial cell, cell loss around uh, between 15 and 18.5 uh, percent. So what are the advantages of preloaded tissue for DMEC and or PDEC? 
Advantages are less surgical time, less risk of tissue damage and wastage, post-processing endothelial cell counts, less stress for the surgeon. The disadvantages are that the surgeon cannot inspect the tissue before the processing because it's already sent to you in the Jones tube. You must choose the size of the graft when the tissue is requested and that it increase, increases the cost uh, to some extent. Thank you very much again for having us. I really enjoyed the time here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for patient hearing. Thank you.